Hello and welcome. My name is Christy Canterbury. I'm a master of wine and I'm here today to speak with you about how to conduct a proper wine tasting. Uh, I started that with that bit of music because when we think about sitting down to a proper wine tasting, we often think about blind wine tasting. Certainly it's something that we see in, in indie movies these days and that sort of thing. So it's a bit of um, urban uh, legend, blind wine tastings, and, and those involve a good amount of suspense. Of course, there are many different kinds of wine tastings, and I'm going to walk you through a number of those today. But first, a quick bit about me, in case you haven't seen one of my presentations before or read one of my articles for this site. Um, I write and speak about wine as well as critique wine today. I also construct or reconstruct wine lists for hospitality venues. Currently I'm working on a 10,000 bottle seller for a Manhattan private club. I've previously overseen the wine list at Loch Lomond Golf Club, Gordon Ramsay at the London, and a number of other well-known venues. Prior to that, I was the national wine director for the 16 restaurants of Smith & Linsky Restaurant Group and then oversaw the, saw, oversaw the global beverage operations at Culinary Concepts by Jean-Georges Vangerichten. In the retail sector, I oversaw purchasing for Italian wine merchants and Zaki's in both New York City and Hong Kong. Along the way, I earned the Master of Wine title, Vintage 2011, and in that pursuit more than any other, I learned the very fine details of conducting proper wine tastings. So let's get started. When we organize tastings, we aim to learn something. And that's my point in this quote from Basil Fawlty from the late 70s British TV series, Fawlty Towers. There's always a danger in thinking or pretending that we know more than we do. Bordeaux and Claret are one and the same. And in being overly confident when we taste or blind taste. Uh, blind tasting is humbling and hard no matter how good you are and how often you practice. But whether blind or not, proper wine tastings provide an excellent opportunity to learn about vintages, winemaking styles, single grape varieties, or all of the above and all at once. Group tastings can also do the opposite. One of the least useful experiences in wine tasting is being given a wine like a Napa Valley Chenin Blanc, totally blind, unless you're tasting is about unusual wines or you're just being asked whether or not you like a wine there's not much you can do with that glass except hone your tasting deduction work. Unfortunately, we all too often learn well after we've started messing around with the wine that it's an outlier. Um, and we often spend a lot of that time trying to shoehorn it into a classic category. So, oh, someone's fooled us. Well, years ago, I walked into a Saturday night gathering with friends and I was handed a Napa Valley Chenin Blanc straight out of the freezer, over, overly chilled. What was the point? I could see the anticipation in the room I kind of went through some of the, the steps, oh, you know, really fruity, alcoholic, um, viscous, uh, new world wine, um, some oak on it, some nice oak on it. Maybe it's, you know, maybe it's from Napa. Can't really tell what the, the, the grape variety is. Maybe it's a blend. It's not a Chardonnay. And I said, listen, this is really not great context. I had to pop some bubbles of excitement, but it was what it was. Um, proper wine tastings have a theme and a purpose. Playing stump the jump translates into time, money, and opportunity wasted. Tip-top pros, certainly, and tip-top collectors uh, who are, are good at doing this and do it often, absolutely can deduce wines, uh, varieties, regions of origins, vintages, um, rarely, if it's in a, a smaller context, vineyards and producers, uh, but even on a good day, and I repeat, blind tasting remains very humbling, um, even for the most discerning palate. But there are a number of types of tasting, so let's walk through them. While tasting parameters here are specifically for sit-down tastings, most of the principles would apply to walk-around tastings as well. So we've got sided blind, double blind, and deductive, and I'm just gonna explain those quickly, although the first one probably doesn't need much help, uh, <laughs> you don't need much help with. Um, sided tasters obviously see the labels, the vintages, the producers. Um, these tend to be uh, most useful when discovering a grape variety or a wine style, let's say, a series of, of classic Italian white wines. Um, some are blind, meaning only a region or a grape variety is revealed. A category could be as basic as red wines from Bordeaux, where a group is trying to determine maybe the subregions, you know, Pomerol, Margot, maybe what the blends are. Is it more Cabernet? Is it more Merlot in this wine? Or it could be as specific as Blanc de Blanc Champagnes from the 2002 Vintage, where a group is examining which wines are the best of an already excellent category um, 
trying to maybe rank them in order or maybe trying to pinpoint the producers. Um, there are also double blind tastings like the one I described previously with the Napa Valley Chenin Blanc where tasting, tasters know nothing about the wines except for the colors that they can see in their glasses. Um, those tend to be uh, really the, the, the least productive um, if you're trying to learn something. It's certainly great if you're trying to really test your acuity um, in blind tasting or if you're training for some sort of a wine exam. Um, blind tastings can also be termed deductive, as the tasters have to work out what the wines are based from what they taste in the glass and what they know about the set of wines before them. Um, an example of the latter would be, let's say, a set of six Merlot dominant wines um, from each from a different classic region around the world. And the taster's mission would be to determine from where each wine hails. So I'm going to expand on what I was just talking about um, in establishing a theme for your tasting. Single blind tastings and blind deductive tastings give participants the best chances of enjoying themselves, which is actually important because you want them to do it again with you most likely, um, as well as learning something because there is a frame of reference. And there are boundless options for themes, such as um, in our, our blind um, or blind deductive category, major red single grape varieties from the USA. Okay, I've got Cabernet Merlot, Zinfandel, Pinot Noir, and of course you can have as many wines as you want, but this is just, you know, let's say it's for, for grapes, for glasses. Um, so I've got major red grapes, so you know, no one should be in the, the category of Sangiovese or Nebbiolo from California. That's not a major grape um, from the USA, anywhere. Um, I've also, um, you know, I've, I've, I've got four grape varieties, four glasses here, but you might get someone who says, oh, that Zinfandel is spicy. Oh, that's a Syrah. Okay. Yep. Could have been a Syrah, um, certainly, but uh, you're, you're not very far out of those four grape varieties, uh, maybe with a Syrah. Can't really think of much off the top of my head that you would um, have in there, but that could be, you know, one way to, to approach a, a, a more... Um, uh, condensed um, and, and well-framed uh, style of a blind tasting. Um, you could do famous red wines from around the world, and I've got here Mendoza, Ugo, ba Ugo Valley, Rioja Gran Reserva, Jeremy Charmertin, Parmi Cru, Barossa Shiraz. Um, this can be any red in the world, so it can be really good to give some context. Um, otherwise, they can get quite frustrating. Uh, it could be any wine. Does it say that it's a specific variety? They were all single variety wines. You might you might mention that if there's no if it's just a pure Tempranillo in that Grand Reserva, you, you could mention that. Just try to help narrow things down. Um, although you know may or may not help everyone. Um, you could also say in this specific example, well you know two are from the old world and two are from the new world. So if someone got to that Gevray Chamber, uh, sorry, excuse me, the Barossa Shiraz, then oh that's really spicy. That Syrah, that's Cote Roti, but they'd already found the Gevre Chambertin and the Rioja Grand Reserva, they'd say, uh uh, hmm, one of these is going to have to change. So that's a productive way to approach the tasting. You could also say, you know, these are all high end famous red wines from around the world, so that no one's going into Rioja Crianza or Bourgogne Rouge. Again, just really setting a nice framework so that everyone is on a more even playing field, unless you know that you're with a really um, higher end group of, of palettes. Uh, and I shouldn't, I mean more uh, developed uh, group of palettes. You could do white wines from France. Uh, Muscadet Pouli Marche, Chateauneuf du Pape Blanc, Alsace Pinot Gris. Um, well, you know, technically white wines from France could all come from the same region. Uh, so it might be nice to say, hey, each comes from a different region or maybe even a different major region. Um, so if you get someone who gets the Muscadet and then finds the Alsace Pinot Gris and says, oh, maybe that's Sauvignon, it's like, oh, no, 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 I've already got one in the Loire. That, that other, that Pinot Gris has to go somewhere else. Um, you know, and again, emphasize maybe that they're major regions of France so that someone's not maybe trying to shoehorn that Muscadet into a, a white wine from the Savoie, um, something like that. So you, it's always, you can always um, layer on um, bits, of, uh, bits of information to kind of help guide people to the right answer. Um, and of course, you could have your open label tastings. Um, Riesling vertical of Mosul's Velen or Sonner Vineyard. Um, and maybe you just taste all the vintages uh, or certain vintages from one producer, or um, maybe you have a collection of different producers and, and you might have, let's say, 
three different vintages of 2000 and you've got, and you say, oh, we're trying to figure out which, um, which one belongs to which producers. And you know, you've got JJ Prume, S.A. Prume, Marcus Molitor, and um, Kirpin, let's just say. And so you're trying to figure out um, which one is, is from which producer. So um, all perfectly, um, perfectly good ways to frame tastings um, based on what you're trying to do and how specifically you're trying to focus the learning of the group. All oh, right, now preparing the wine tasting environment. Um, light surface, space, smell, and location. Obviously, most of us don't want to taste in a clinical laboratory setting like I've, I've shown in the picture here. Um, however, if you're looking at older wines or an array of young to old wines, you'll want brighter light. You'll also want the light coming down on top of the glasses rather than from the side angles. Mood lighting, not ideal for focused wine tastings. Surface, um, it is always best to look down at the wines against a white medium, whether it's tablecloth or a tasting mat. A white uh, background helps the eye focus on the color from the meniscus to the core. Um, you get lots of nuances out of that. Um, a tasting mat can be as basic as a sheet or a couple of sheets of paper, printer paper, um, just put uh, taped together in front of you. Uh, or it could even be a plastic picnic tablecloth bought at a dollar store. Um, if the lighter sounds inelegant, remember that so are irretrievably stained linens and any cursing that may ensue discovering the damage. Just say. Um, they're, they're just options, um, so I'm putting them out there because um, you really do want to look at a white surface when you're tasting. Um, also space. Um, it may be fun to see a, a table so full of glasses that it's hard to move them around, but that's going to have someone running for the club soda or the wine away or kosher salt. Um, not worth it. Allowing ample room for glasses, a spittoon, a bottle or glass of water, some note-taking paper, um, and the elbow room uh, required to maneuver um, is really important. Keep those accidents away from you. Also, don't set up um, the tasting glasses at the edge of the table. People are going to want to write right in front of them, so try to move the glasses um, further away so that there's room for a notepad or a piece of paper um, in front of the taster. Um, smell. No one wants to smell the aftershave um, left over on someone's uh, blazer um, when they're sitting beside them or to sit so close to someone that they smell this morning's round of golf on them. Uh, also remind attendees to hold off on any grooming products uh, that day that are smelly um, and please no smoking uh, before tasting wine and you might think that it goes without saying but people forget we're creatures of habit and we put on the cologne or we put on the aftershave. So just remind people it's, it's worth trying at least. Uh, finally, location. Thinking about tasting outside? Hmm. Remember that fresh air carries allergens for those um, who are sensitive um, and also breezes carry away aromas. Um, so oftentimes it's not great to taste outside. Um, plus it's harder to manage your wine temperatures outside. Uh, I was once at an outdoor tasting in Burgundy it was nighttime in November. There were thousands of dollars and hundreds of bottles of wine sitting on the table, and it was really hard to appreciate them because they were all super cold. So for a serious wine tasting, it's best to stay indoors. So following on the idea of tasting outside or conversely inside by a roaring fireplace, if your tasting environment turns out to be sweltering or otherwise uncomfortable for humans, the wines won't stay at their ideal t temperature for tasting long either. To properly focus on tasting, it's best that people feel comfortable so that their attention remains on the wines, not on their surroundings. As for the wines themselves, proper wine tasting temperatures, preferences for drinking can vary wildly and that's fine. But um, for wines, for tasting, it's around 50 degrees Fahrenheit for light wines, pale rosés, 55 to 60 for richer whites, darker rosés, 60 to 65 for reds. And of course, lighter reds can be a little cooler than the heavier reds, uh, but still, you're kind of in that 60 to 65 uh, degree temperature uh, span. Keep in mind that wines warm up once you're out of the fridge or the ice bucket, and especially once they are in a tasting glass surrounded by the ambient air temperature. If your group leans to the nerdy side, use an instant read thermometer. Yep, the one that's already probably in your kitchen to make sure that your wines are in the ideal temperature range at the time of service. Now, tasting order makes a big difference, even if tasters think that they can power through whatever is in front of them. If there are a lot of wines or multiple styles of wine, Take the time to schedule the time for each flight, let people know about it, um, and take the time that's required to prep each flight. 
cutting foils, popping corks, numbering bottles, numbering glasses, all that stuff needs to get done so that there's no confusion and you're able to focus on the wines and not logistics. Um, very, 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 very important. Taste all the wines in the same glasses. It is ideal for everyone to taste all of the wines, at least those in a single flight, at once and in the same glass style. If necessary, taste in flights, but all in the same glasses. Much has been made about tasting wines in different glasses for a reason. The glass should be minimized as a variable in the tasting experience, and the glass should optimize the tasting experience. This sounds like a little bit too much washing up afterwards. Well. There are options. There are clear, stainless, thin-lipped, disposable glasses available online, like the, the little kind of like the, the glasses that you would have around a pool. Um, is, they're available for $1.25 a glass. They are the perfect size for taste a tasting portion of wine. They can be thrown into the recycling bin or even put in the top rack of the dishwasher most of the time. They're not as desirable as crystal by any stretch of the imagination, but it's a decent compromise if you've got a lot of wines and a lot of tasters. And I propose this because I have seen people who self-identify as geeky wine collectors, very possibly someone watching this video at some point, bring a motley assortment of glasses to a tasting and even to a restaurant. They think that they're being cool. They know that glasses are important, but what they bring is ridiculous. You get a, a Burgundy, um, a Burgundy Zalto, followed by a couple of real Cabernets, and then a couple of random white wine glasses. No, no, no. That does not work for serious wine assessment, full stop. And um, furthermore, glass size matters. If you are pouring wine tastes, meaning two or three ounces, the glass size is very, very important. Those enormous restaurant style glasses are great for dinner. I love drinking out of them. That's what I use. Um, but some of them can hold a bottle and that is just large enough for all of those aromas that you're trying to learn from to get totally lost in the glass. Um, it is really hard to smell tasting pores in a big Zalto glass. Um, so using smaller glasses will deliver a clear perception of the wine overall. Plus, they're easier to transport if you want to be very geeky and make sure that you're consistently tasting from the same wine and that you're getting the same thing over and over. Much easier. I have had the same tasting glasses for almost 20 years. They look about um, just like the ones that are in the, the pictures here. They have a bowl shape with a thin lip um, at the rim, um, and it's tapered in just a little bit at the top. It fills with a midpoint. They hold about three and a half ounces. I occasionally experiment with other glasses, part of my job, um, and I'm just curious. I want to know if there's something better out there, but so far, I've stuck with these glasses the entire time. Mind you, I don't like to drink from those glasses. I like to drink from the big Zalto glasses, the big Riedel glasses at home. Don't want to be thinking about work or tasting. I want to pour a larger amount of wine in the glass and watch it evolve over time. But for tasting, I always taste from my small tasting glasses. And mind you, this kind of tasting glass also works very well for everything for dessert wines, for fortified wines, and for sparkling wines. Flutes are great for looking at the bubbles. They're not doing much for the nose. And coupes, well, we don't even need to go there. Um, they're terrible. Uh, they look very cool in retro, but they're terrible for the wines. So, um, of course, then finally, we need to ration properly. The wine glass volume and the number of required pours will determine the number of bottles you need. Obviously, I pour two ounces for a tasting with a large number of samples, and uh, maybe three ounces for a smaller set. So I generally plan for one bottle for every 12 or eight guests. If you pour two ounces, that also leaves you about an ounce and a half so that you can taste in advance to see if there's any problem with the wine. Is it corked? Is it matterized? Heat affected? Is it reductive? Um, Obviously, you can't do that when you have old vintage bottles, but it's much easier um, if you have current release wines uh, to have an extra bottle handy. All right, and finally, keep the peace. <laughs> um, establish the correct wine identifications in advance and avoid inadvertently providing clues. Um, so first of all, sometimes you just don't realize how competitive people can be until they have tasted 20 plus wines and are utterly convinced that they have knocked out their IDs. Um, a correct ID can depend a bit on the context of the wine, especially on Saturday night when you're with friends. Um, did someone say Cabernet from Napa, but it was actually Alexander Valley? Well, if the scope of Cabernet is from around the world, I would say that that person pretty much nailed it. But if the wines are 
all from California, you would need a much more specific answer. And those clues. It's all too easy to accidentally leave the corks in the kitchen corner where someone might see them all washing up their hands before the tasting. Um, and there are always sneaky people who seek out clues. So hide bottles in aluminum foil or use mylar or paper bags. Make sure you, you seal them up at the top, maybe with tape or with a rubber band. Um, also, if you have um, any revealing uh, neck foils, tear those off, tape them up, um, don't give away valuable details. In the face of intense rivalries, pour the wines yourself. Um, some people will grope the bottles. And on that note, if there are different grape varieties um, spread across the tasting experience, the bottle shapes can suggest what the grape varieties may be. Um, Rieslings come in flute-shaped bottles, Pinot Noirs in those slope-shaped burgundy bottles, Cabernets in the high-shouldered Bordeaux bottles. So if the wines are young and can withstand decanting and you're doing a blind tasting, you could consider using a funnel and decanting each of the wines into cleaned, dry new bottles so that you just have a plain bottle uh, that everyone can pour themselves from. Um, I've, I've, I've been around the block a few times on these <laughs> and know some of the tricks. So um, finally, just want to wish you best of luck as you arrange your tastings. Um, hope you learn a lot, have a lot of fun, um, find a great group to do more of those with. Thank you for joining me with this presentation. And if you have any questions on how to organize proper wine tastings, you can find me on any of these channels. It'd be a pleasure to talk to you. Cheers.